it's a pleasure to be here. And um, we, we, we always, <clears throat> we, we welcome discussions in this type of, 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 of forum because part of the new leadership of the civil service, we've made a conscious decision of being out more and trying to explain what we're doing and to hear back on how well we're doing or how, how badly we're doing, as the case might be. So it's delighted to be here and always delighted to be in the Institute. So reform, <clears throat> uh, uh, as, I was saying, as I was saying to people earlier, when you go around uh, at the moment, walk around town or cycle or drive around town, all these posters and all this electioneering and everybody's in favour of change and reform. But it's very hard to get a sense of change to what, reform to what. What does it actually mean? What are they, what are they look? They want more accountability, they want more transparency, they want lower taxes or higher taxes or more spending or whatever it is, 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 is people want. So we tried to explain reform and in terms of what we mean by reform in the public sector is that we do more with less. It's about productivity. It's about improving outcomes in health, education, labour market. And it's also about openness and accountability and transparency. Issues which are, are more to the fore again, given uh, uh, things that have happened over the last few, last few months are particularly affecting the Department of Justice. So that's our sense of reform. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we've been doing uh, and where we're going to go. So, the, so management consultants always talk about the burning platform. So we've had a really, we've had a fabulously, uh, fabulously little platform for some time now. Fiscal crisis, economic crisis, need to cut spending, uh, increased demand for services, they need to do all this while retaining industrial peace. And also, I think, a very important issue, which is not necessarily related to fiscal issues or economic issues or priority of the public service, but rebuilding trust. How can we rebuild trust and rebuild the connection between institutions of the state, the civil service, and the people that we purport uh, to serve? And I'm the first to admit, and Brendan Howell, if he was here, would agree, that there's an awful lot more that needs to be done in order to rebuild trust. Uh, and it's, 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 it's obviously a, a fracture which uh, we, need to, we need to work on. I want to talk a little bit about consolidation very briefly, and I have a few graphs. Like, uh, reform has been essential for us to reduce spending and reduce the deficit. And it's interesting, I hope everybody can see this. I just got these graphics this morning to look at how much consolidation we've, we've done. And this is trends in the primary balance, so the, 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 the balance excluding interest payments, which is a good way of measuring it. And we're the green line, of course, and we've reduced that by nine percentage points. This is GDP uh, within a five-year period which is quite a significant rate of consolidation. And that's required an awful lot of decisions, an awful lot of spending decisions, tax decisions, and reform decisions. You can see other countries, what they've done. And I think even probably a better measure, and I won't go through this in detail, but people can see it in the pack, is to look at trends in the primary balance adjusting for the economic cycle, because things have moved against us in a way which have increased the demand, the pressures for more services. So to get even this measure of consolidation is even, is even more useful. And you can see in this measure, we've taken it down by about 11 percentage points of GDP. This is unprecedented uh, for our country. And I think apart from uh, one or two examples of other developed uh, economies, it's without precedent. So this has been an enormous achievement. And you can see on this measure for 2014, we're down to uh, a, a primary balance, which is a, a significant achievement and very important in terms of debt dynamics and where we go in terms of future, future policy. Uh, so we've done this in two ways. We've increased taxes and charges, as everybody, everybody knows. Uh, and we've also reduced spending uh, quite dramatically. One of the things we've tried to do, and this speaks to the reform agenda, is to focus on reducing unit costs and drive efficiency as opposed to reducing the volume of services where possible. And you can see right over on the left-hand side, public sector pay. A big chunk of the fall has been due to public sector pay, pay cuts, pension levies, numbers reductions. People have retired uh, from the system and pensions have gone up. That was a demographic, and I see some of our colleagues here, so we're still paying the pensions uh, from that particular superannuation vote. <laughs> we're glad to, <coughs> glad to hear it's costing us more. Uh, that's why they're here. Great to see. More people unemployed have increased the cost of the live register. But interestingly enough, I think this feeds into the debate. <clears throat> if you look at health non-pay and education non-pay, very modest, if any, reductions in health and education spending outside of core pay rates and, and the pay bill. So in terms of the volume, we haven't really cut back, and I'll talk a bit about the improvements, the volume of some of these key services in health and education, despite much of the debate out there. But this other category here at 3.4 billion, if you look at everything outside of social welfare, education, health, has been absolutely decimated on the current side. So everything else the state does, all the remainder, there's been enormous reductions in spending and enormous efficiencies. Uh, so I would argue that the consolidation linked to reform 
has done it the right way around, focused on unit costs, tried to protect uh, core social welfare rates, the core and, and core services in health and education, and everything else has taken a significant hit. And there's also a significant reduction in capital spending compared to where we thought we would be and compared to where we were five or six years ago. Now, there's a debate about capital. Has that gone too far? Will we start seeing bottlenecks now in infrastructure unless we can ramp up investment? Are we spending the money on the right projects? There's a debate to be had about we're now spending around 2% of GMP, just over $3 billion on capital spending. Is that enough, given our demographic profile? Anyway, that's a, that's a debate that we're having uh, at the moment. But I just thought it was interesting to set out what's actually happened, and I've summarised it here. 16% reduction in cash terms, and I've mentioned the areas uh, where, where the, the axe has, has, has fallen. This is uh, voted spending, <coughs> uh, current and capital. So it's overall spending of the state, excluding interest payments on the debt. And the interest payments on the debt, as we know, are now significant, 5% of, of, of income, and due to go up a little, bit, a little bit more before they start coming down. But voted spending, so the spending on social services, on goods and services, capital, has fallen uh, by about 10 percentage points over this period. So significant progress has been made, and based on the likely spending profile for the next three years, and as GMP and GDP, the denominator, improves, we're going to see further falls uh, in that. And of course, the big political economy debate, which we we'll have particularly in 18 months, two years' time, uh, if that's when the next election takes place, or that time period, a big debate about where, where is the size of the state and what that means for tax and what that means for social provision. But we we're back down on a trajectory, so we're back down to where we were in 2008, and based on current policy, the state, as a percentage of our income, will be back down to 2004, 2005 levels within the next 18 months, two years. So a very significant correction uh, has, uh, in my view, the correct, correct approach, but a very significant adjustment has taken place. Uh, when we talk to people in the private sector, they always say to me, oh, we've cut spending dramatically during the recession. And I say, yeah, because the demand for what you do has fallen in a lot of cases. But in a recession, the opposite happens for the government, of course, because we're, we provide a social safety net. We still have to provide more people with medical cards or the increase in the number of people with medical cards. And we have demographic pressures that we have to deal with. So we've been downsizing and reforming when the demand for what we do is increasing and increasing in some cases quite dramatically. And I've just outlined some of the, some of the numbers uh, the number of people of pensionable age is going up around one and a half, two percent each year. And that's going to continue for some time. Uh, we've had a, a, a number of births has been very high. We've more people staying in full time. So the demands placed on us uh, has been going up as we've been trying to reduce spending. Reform. So there are three strands to reform. And I won't. I have a few slides here. I won't go through all of them, but just to give you a flavour: political, administrative, strategic, uh, and the operational. The strategic. In 2011, thankfully the, the date is there so I can remember, November 2011, we set out a reform plan. <clears throat> and one of, the, one of the failings in the past was that we produced these glossy publications uh, about what we're going to do, how we're going to reform the civil service, the public sector, without specifying the actions, who's responsible for delivering, and by when. So we deliberately moved to a less sexy, less glossy approach, which actually had an implementation plan. I mean, a lot of resistance in the system to actually having this implementation plan. So we published this report in 2011, which set out, this is what we're going to do, <clears throat> and we broadly delivered, I think, about 89% of that. And we've now uh, refreshed, uh, refreshed this for a new plan, and I think we, we have copies, uh, we have copies uh, today, which sets out our vision for the future. A key part of all this has been the operational environment, which was Crow Park and then Haddington Road. So you need the strategic, you need the political support, but you also need an operational framework within which we can work and deliver the changes. So significant <coughs> achievements. And I'll talk about some of these in, in detail, about what, we've, about what we've done. Strengthened spending controls, lower spending, Haddington Road agreement, deployment of shared services. We're embarking on a very significant uh, shared services, consolidation across the civil service and outside, outsourcing of non-core work, Consolidation of procurement, which we'll talk about in a moment. A property action plan. We're reducing our footprint. So the public sector is getting smaller. We don't need the same number of offices and buildings, uh, and we're downsizing there. Better use of ICT and online services, and the public service card, which I'll talk about uh, in, a, in a moment, and a number of cross-government appointments. A key, key element of what we're trying to do is to look at the system more in a unified way. So to consolidate procurement, to consolidate how we're doing ICT, shared services. So rather than having pockets doing various things and silos on policy to try really move towards what we call a unified uh, civil service. Productivity improvements, key part of what we're doing. I won't go through all of this, uh, but you can see some of the changes brought about by Haddington Road uh, in particular. Haddington Road was an incredible productivity deal. 15 million more hours worked along with a whole variety of changes, changes which we've been seeking for 20, uh, 30 years in work practices, uh, demarcation issues, 
uh, rostering, uh, and so on. And you can see some of the impact of, of, of these changes uh, and how it's impacted on productivity uh, in, diff in different sectors. Uh, very significant uh, improvements. Uh, and this environment, this environment of reform, and reform based on a consensual approach with the trade union movement, we believe has been very important in terms of embedding stability and enable us to get through the difficult austerity of the last number of years and enabling us to exit from the Troika programme. So we think all those different elements are very important uh, in terms of, of, of what we've been doing. And people were amazed that despite the difficult cuts and the difficult retrenchment that we are managed to keep people with us. I think that stability, and particularly now that we have this stability, people don't seem to value it as much when we have it. But I, I, I think we need to think about what the counterfactual could have been. And we don't have to go too far to look at some other countries who've gone through very difficult austerity and had a lot of social unrest and IR problems about what the counterfactual could have been for us. So I would put a great value on the benefits of stability and the consensual approach to us actually getting through, uh, getting through what, we've, what we've got through. So the new reform plan, and I'll go through uh, this, this quickly. So just to focus on on five issues, five priorities of where, where we think we should go now. And uh, Minister Howland uh, is always very keen when we do a plan to have an iterative process of engagement. And we've gone to DAW committees, gone to other groups, and we said, well, this is our view. This is our plan of where we should go for the public service and civil service. But we'd like to hear it on, uh, this afternoon. We'd certainly like to hear what people think about the priorities on what we're doing. So there are five themes. Innovation in how we deliver services. So to look at how we deliver service and think, are there new models, are there new ways of service delivery? We had a particular approach. Does that work? Are there other models out there? Digital government, how we engage with citizens. Increasingly, we get more complaints from people uh, saying that they like to interact with us the same way as they do with Ryanair or our Lingus in terms of booking, as opposed to people complaining that we've closed down that traditional channel. It's very interesting when you think about it. The political resistance historically will be, I want to talk to somebody. I want to go and visit that office. So when we move to digital... You get a bit of that. But increasingly, we have people saying, we're just frustrated that the system isn't as savvy. Our access isn't as easy as it is uh, how we access services in the private sector. So digital government, further cost reduction, openness and accountability. So we need to improve uh, performance through improving accountability. And we need a much more open system and engage more uh, in how we do our business. And I want to talk a little bit about the civil service uh, renewal process. So innovation service delivery. We're doing more, providing more services externally than ever before. The local property tax uh, uh, centre uh, was outsourced. Uh, driving licence, third level grants, the SUSE, uh, uh, which despite some early glitches is turning into a fantastic and effective, uh, effective service, delivered mainly externally. And we're now looking at a whole variety of projects uh, which will be delivered externally or in partnership with private providers. And I've listed some of them, some of them there. Uh, but in effect... What, what we're doing in terms of how we we're look, the way we look at public services, we say, okay, the traditional approach would have been that we provide a grant to a body, uh, and that grant is there forevermore unless somebody decides that we're not happy with the outcomes or value for money. So we would like to move to a situation where rather than service, the default position that services are provided by public servants in a traditional public sector setting, that we look at different models. And they could be an outsourced model to a private sector, or they could be engaged with community groups or voluntary groups. But the key thing from our perspective is to try and move to more of a commissioning model, to try and move away from block grants to more outcomes. So we commission for outcomes, and we have a more contestable market, and we have much more evidence backing up uh, policy and more commissioning. And this, is, this, in effect, is our view uh, in terms of the trends in service. Now, I know this could be controversial, uh, and there's a lot of resistance to it in some part, but looking at different ways of service delivery, because we know that traditional monopoly, monolith public services uh, aren't necessarily the best in terms of being innovative or responsive or efficient. So to look at different ways uh, of service delivery is a key part. And, and hooking up with organisations like Genio, Centre for Effective Service, which some, some people here will be familiar with, we think is a very fruitful way uh, for us to go. Digital government. Uh, we, there's two ways of looking at, 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 at this. Uh, it's how people engage with us. So people want to engage with us through a digital platform. So they prefer to do it themselves at their own time, pay their own property tax. It's interesting that people, of course, hate the property tax, but we've received so many compliments about how efficient it is to pay it. You know, it's most unusual. It's, oh, yeah. it's really easy to pay that tax, even though it'll like it. <laughs> so it's, sort of, it's interesting how people look at these things. So people want to engage with us, and they want to pay their tax or do their business in a, in, on their own, their own time, their own space, uh, in an efficient way. A big challenge for us, that's, so, so to an extent, 
That's not easy, but it's a simpler part of us providing a discrete service in that way. The real trick for us is to have a more integrated approach to how we deliver services. And this requires national data infrastructure, requires the PPS number, a unique identifier, it needs single customer view, it needs a public service card. It needs, in effect, the infrastructure. So at the moment, if you access service, we'll ask you for various information, which we hold. We'll ask you for your, your, your uh, date of birth. We'll ask you for evidence of, of a utility bill, and so on and so forth. In the future, we want this national data infrastructure and public service card to be a passport to services in a much more efficient way. So we won't have to ask you for your date of birth, because we know right, the date of birth of everybody here. We also know your PPS number, and we know where you live. That sounds very threatening, right? But we know, well, unless you've moved the last three months, we have a good fix on where you, on where you live if you pay tax or you access. So, so why we should just ask for your name, your PPS number, and your address. And in the future, we want a situation where that's all we ask from you if you're going to access the service. So let's say you're going to renew uh, your driver license or renew your passport. We have photographs of everybody. So rather than asking you for a new photograph, we'll drag down your existing photograph. It's been taken within the last 10 years unlike most of the election posters, of course, as everybody knows, there seem to be very old photographs out there. But anyway, so a relatively recent uh, fo photograph. So rather than the engagement was being clunky with paper, we want it to be easy so that if, if you've given the information to us before, we're not going to ask you for it again. An example of it in practical terms would be uh, the Susie and uh, applying for a third level grant. So again, we need to know your means, we need to have details on family composition and so on. We have all that information parts of the system. So linking it together, so we don't ask you for your, your P60, or we don't ask you for a statement of social welfare. We ask your basic information, have an identity, identity card with your ID. From then we can assess very quickly whether you're eligible for the third-level grant, whether you're eligible for a medical card, or whatever it happens to be. So this, this data infrastructure, this, this is the real integration piece around data sharing and integrated government and service provision, which is really, really key. And... Uh, a key part of what we're trying to do is look at the top transactional service. So the big transactional services that people engage with us, how can we make it easier? So there are, the top 20 services account for about 80-85% of the transactions. So to focus on those, driver license renewal, passport, engagement with revenue, social protect, so those big areas. And that's really a key part of what we're trying to do. Also, uh, open data. This is an area where we're really only exploring the potential, all the data that we have, to put it out there. So put the data out there and let people in the private sector, commercial world, commercialise if, if, it, if it has value and to try to figure out what the protocol uh, around that. So this is some, these are some of the things, Chairman, we're doing on the, on, the, on the digital, which I think is very exciting and over time can have a, a big impact. I won't talk too much more about Haddington Road. We, we, we've spoken about it. A lot of changes in work practice, a lot of changes in structures, and we're getting cooperation uh, with these changes. And it's a function, obviously, of the difficult environment, within which we operate, uh, and the austerity period, and so on. But we get, at this stage, fantastic cooperation with change and reform. And issues which would have led to disputes and would have ended up in the Labour Court we're now able to resolve and deal with very quickly. So the, the IR environment, the change environment, uh, is much more accommodating than it would have been uh, in, in the past. Talk about shared services very, uh, very briefly. <clears throat> we're doing, within the civil service, just take civil service for, for the moment. We have 35,000 staff. We have 18 payroll centres. So we have 18 different entities paying uh, the wages of 35,000 employees. It's absolutely, it's crazy that we don't have a consolidated approach which could save us. So we have a plan to move it from 18 to 3. Within the civil service, in terms of, of transactional HR, we had 48 bodies doing their own transactional HR, their own time and attendance, sick leave, all that. And that's now been consolidated in people point, a shared service to actual service in, in Klonski, which now serves 24,000 customers and will have 35,000 by next year. And we're doing consolidation of finance functions and a whole variety of issues in civil service. So <clears throat> in effect, the, the vision of civil service departments, and this is important in terms of the improving outcomes and policy, civil service and depart departments in the future won't be doing their own procurement, won't be doing their own payroll, HR, pension administration. They, all those things will be taken out and consolidated and delivered centrally. So we want departments to focus in terms of HR on strategic HR. We want them to focus on policy, on foresight, on supporting ministers. So taking out those non-core functions and shared service is a big part of it. So we're doing it for the civil service and we also have plans then within the health system and local government to do comparable, uh, comparable types of, of consolidation. This stuff is not, not very sexy or exciting, but it can lead to very significant cost savings and can lead to improvements 
in how we, how we, we function. Procurement, again, uh, not the most exciting, exciting topic. We spend nine billion on the current side every year on buying goods and services. And we did an exercise uh, about 18 months, two years ago, and we discovered that whole range of different entities and bodies across the public sector were buying the same good or same service from the same supplier for different terms, different prices, different conditions. So our monopsony power, as economists would call it, was not being utilised. So we're now consolidating more and more of the spending. So if we're buying chairs, tables, printers, certain professional services, a whole variety of different goods and services, it's been consolidated in a new office of government procurement, and we're professionalising it. And this is it. I think this is a, a, a theme throughout the reform, that the civil service went too much in the direction of the generalist model and moved away from the specialised model. And we need to re-specialise and reskill in a variety of areas, HR, economics, accounting, auditing law, and in procurement. Because as people know, procurement is itself a very specialised activity. And it's also governed by a very difficult legal framework, a lot of litigation. So we have smaller bodies, smaller departments who have part-time, very well-intended, very good people, but part-time procurers. And it's not a very efficient approach and we're not getting value for money. So this exercise here in itself is an enormous reform. So in effect, government departments and bodies that previously were procuring won't be in the future and it'll be centralised in this office of, of government procurement. And we have now staff, we have about 80 staff specialists and we'll have about 200, 250 people who will be buying uh, six, seven billion worth of goods and services across uh, the public sector. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a, a, key, a key part of the work of our department, obviously spending reductions, reform, but also to try to uh, rebuild trust in the public sector and in, 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 in the civil service. And we admit that there's a lot to do and recent events, I think, have once again damaged people, the brand damaged people's perceptions of, of, how, of how we do our business. There's a variety of reforms here. Uh, Introduction of lobbying regulation, so people who lobby us, it's going to be transparent, so it's fine to lobby, that's allowed, people need to influence government, need to influence policy, but it'll be a register, a public register, so when Brendan comes to talk to me about something, whatever it happens to be, we'll have a great chat, but it'll be put in a register, uh, and then we can see then that we had a conversation and, and broad content of what we, we, we spoke about, and that'll be important, that legislation will be passed by the end of the year. We've uh, reformed FOI, broadened FOI, repeal in effect in 2003, act uh, a much more open uh, regime in terms of FI, protected disclosures, and again, whistleblowers in common parlance, topical issue of the last few months, we're at committee stage with a very robust piece of legislation which will provide protections, uh, very vigorous protections for people who make uh, accusations or who, who, who bring to light malpractice and, and problems and that'll be, that'll be enacted by end of June. We're participating in Open Government Partnership. We're developing a new ethical framework for office holders and public service and modernise that whole approach to ethics. And we're engaged now in a very significant consultation process around accountability and performance. And some people may have seen the paper that we produced uh, on this. And we think this is key because we don't believe that we can drive performance unless we have different accountability approaches, uh, unless we publish our objectives and people are called to account for those objectives, and my own view, not just the Secretary General of a department, but right down to middle managers, what we call the top thousand. So there, from PO upwards, there are a thousand people, and we believe they should be more accountable for delivery of particular projects, particular programs, and they should have to account in a public way for, for how they're performing. But this, for us to drive performance, we need better accountability, but also we need a more mature debate uh, in our office committees, in the media, about failings, about things that don't go right. So rather than turning into a witch hunt, the gotcha culture, we need to move to an accountability culture which involves learning. So it's not just about you know, firing that person or whatever it happens to be, but it's about learning from the mistakes, about how can we do better about uh, figuring out how we could improve things for the future. So this is a really important, I think, aspect of, of, of driving, uh, driving performance. How do we get better accountability mechanisms? And the challenges that we face here are very similar to other, other countries in terms of... So finally then, civil service uh, renewal. Uh, and this is linked to a lot of what I've been talking about. So we've made lots of progress in the civil service uh, over the last few years. People can, can have their own judgments as to the extent to which uh, we could have done better or the areas where we need to improve. But we've increased productivity. We've standardised annual leave sick leave. We now have senior public service leadership uh, across the civil, much more mobility. We're investing more in, in learning and development, uh, open recruitment, and so on. So we're, we've done a lot. But now the challenge for us is in terms of the next phase of where we go. So what's the vision 
What's the, the 2020 vision for the Irish Civil Service? What are we going to look like? Where should we go? What do we need to modernise? So how can we hold on to the good values, hard work, commitment to the state, impartiality, independence, objectivity? Uh, how can we hold on to those good values while driving improvement and being better uh, in terms of supporting government, in terms of policy advice, or in improving service? So some of the issues that we need, think we need to look at, grades and spans of control. We have too, too many grades, too hierarchical, so we need to empower people by reducing the number of grades. We need to do more open recruitment. We need to have much more mobility. We need to move people around. We'd like a situation where, in any given management board, which would be Assistant Secretary upwards in a government department, that a large minority or maybe majority of people would have spent a good part of their career outside of that department. And we think that's very important in terms of changing the culture and, and encouraging innovation. Training and development. Uh, Martin Fraser, who who's, people know, Secretary and Taoiseach's department, was in front of a dog committee, <clears throat> and they were criticising for... 100,000 euros he was spending on training and development. And I was listening to the debate, and he, his budget would be, his pay bill would be about 20 million, he's about 250 staff. And I wasn't clear from, I actually listened, watching this in the monitor, I wasn't clear, Mark was being criticised for spending too much or too little, right? And it turned out that they thought it was outrageous to spend money on training and development. Well, that was the criticism. So I, I, I text Martin and said, you've got to wait lightly, because you should be spending 300, 400,000 each year on training and development. Because this, this is the human capital. We know human capital over time declines, the great things move on. So we need as a system to invest much more. We're, we're in the civil service as a whole. So our pay bill is about 1.7 billion. And we're spending, I think, only 20, 25 million each year on training, development. And private sector people here will tell me how, how low that is compared to what we should. Anyway, so we need to invest more uh, in our people. We need to strengthen cross environmental learning and leading and working. So... More and more of the challenges we face, the really difficult policy challenges, whether it's climate change, communities that aren't working, uh, issues around unemployment, it's cross-cutting. So it doesn't fit into a neat department. So how do, we, how do we deliver across the system? And this is leading to a unified civil service, to much more of a unified approach to, to how we've got our business. And critically, building organisation capacity <coughs> and capability. So uh, I'll finish. I don't know how I'm doing for time, Brendan, but I'll fi finish by saying, you know, we, we've made significant progress we're about halfway through, I think, the journey that we, we hope to be on. Uh, and this is the agenda that we've set out for, for, for the, next, the next while. So we look forward to engaging in some, Thank you. some debate.